We live in an interesting age. Um, I just played Forbidden History last weekend. One of, my, uh, one of the books I was reading for Forbidden History is uh, Philip Bobbitt's uh, The Shield of Achilles. And he, in that book, he talks about the structure of apocal wars and the interaction between the state and uh, the constitutional system of states and the military system of states. He misses the kind of economic and production structure side. But he talks about the way that historical periods often don't line up quite the way we think they do. Um, for instance, he labels the period from roughly 1910 or so through the end of the Cold War as being one epochal war in the same way that we talk about the Thirty Years' War. There are eras where we as a civilization, as a society, as a world, have to deal with different kinds of challenges. And the challenge that we're currently dealing with right now is that we have figured out that there are these emergent systems in the world. And we know how to look at them now. We know how to see them. But we don't know what to do with that information. And one of the reasons why we can see them now is that our activities affect them now, right? Our actions, are, are, the scope of our actions has grown broad enough that we can affect worldwide emergent systems and actually you know, see, the, see the outcomes, affect them quickly enough to see the outcomes. Unfortunately, the way that we are learning this is not very good. This is the most depressing slide on the talk. Plan A right now, um, most of you are under 40 in this room. In your lifetimes, plan A is that you see 2 billion people die. That's not a great outcome. That is what we are headed towards, and we're headed towards it very quickly. I would really like a plan B. We don't really have a plan B yet. We have lots of gestures at plan Bs. However, I'm an optimist, which is why I'm here. Um, <laughs> I think we can do this. I think it is entirely reasonable that we can do this. And I think that the history of Homo sapiens shows that we have been able to manage large scale coordination at scales and repeatedly making scale jumps in large scale coordination around resource management and system management in ways that ecosystems are not supposed to be able to do this. We have, we have already solved this problem a few times before. It is entirely reasonable that we can do it again. This time, we get to have to do it consciously. However, it's going to be very close. So if you were somewhat older, this is what the end of the world used to look like. Uh, this is a photo that my dad took when he was stationed in Greece working on uh, hound dog nuclear missiles. That was what the end of the world looked like in 1966. Um, but the interesting thing about the end of the world in 1966 was that we knew what it looked like. It looked like that. It didn't look like that many other things <laughs> other than that. And that was an understandable end of the world, and it was an end of the world where there were serious adults in charge, and things were mostly proceeding in an orderly fashion towards or away from the end of the world, which was great. Um, it was terrifying, it was horrific, it, it hasn't gone anywhere, but it was, it was understandable. Um, of course, it was bullshit. Um, this is a map from, uh, of, of Zomia, which is, and specifically Zomia is the areas <coughs> above the rice growing level in Southeast Asia. Um, there's a book, uh, The Art of not, Ge not Being Governed by James C. Scott. So the narrative that we have of nation state building in Southeast Asia is that the, the states moved in and took over and people became civilized. Actually, it was much more of a complicated interplay where everyone had agency in their relationship with states and moved in and out of being part of the nation state as it suited them. In some cases, going as far as realizing that, hey, our ancestry is one of the tools that the state uses to keep us kind of in its grips. We're going to get rid of that. No one in this, no one in this cultural group will acknowledge that they have great grandparents anymore. And they just forgot. They, they structurally, not only did they become post-literate, but they simply forgot ancestry because it was too dangerous to have some. So they just stopped, um, and very intentionally. So, and this was always there, you know. This, this was always the lie, that's the reality. Um, now it looks much more like this. This is a very, very coarse supply chain map for a relatively simple electronic device. This is what is happening in flow, and we can actually see this. We can build the map. We do build the map. We have to build the map, because if we don't have the map, everything breaks. So, some definitions. 
When I am talking about complex systems, I am talking about systems that display emergent behavior, right? That things happen that we don't expect. Um, if you are familiar with the complex systems world, I am talking about Annapolis style hierarchical complex systems, not um, Santa Fe style string detractors. If you're not, I'll find them in the bar later on. Um, but yeah, we're, we're talking about hierarchical composition where we have simple elements that we can often predict. You know, oh, you push here, something happens here. Okay, great, that's a little module. Let's stack a million of them together and randomly wire them together. Now this looks like nothing we've ever seen before. Um, when I talk about socio-technical systems, I hate that phrase, it is the best one that I've found. Um, these are systems that involve both human interactions and technical interactions. They are both social and technical. And the two of these things relate in interesting and weird ways. All security problems and all adversarial problems are almost always socio-technical. So we also used to think that the world looked like just the adults sitting around and being kind of coherent and sensible and orderly. Um, actually, it looks like this mess, which you know Shakespeare has a lot more on what, what governance actually looked like than, uh, than we think. And there's a lot of emotions in the room, and there's a lot of a lot of the actual, the human, the messy bits have always been part of the picture as well. So adversarial systems are also something that is or to understanding the larger world. Um, these are complex systems where the actors, the humans involved, have different goals. And in many cases, those goals can include inflicting actual harm on each other. These are not systems where everyone is trying towards a single goal. Every competitive system, every competitive situation has a similar structure in the core. Um, war, business, security, all of these things have this adversarial nature. Now, adversarial natures are very interesting. Um, there's a gentleman, uh, John Boyd, who uh, was an ace in Korea, did a bunch of the development work. Basically, he, he was an ace in Korea, he was very good at flying a fighter jet, and he tried to figure out, okay, how do we teach other people how to do this thing? Um, and a lot of what, of course, he was trying to do is teach them how to think. So this, um, this pattern where you see two planes circling, right? They're each trying to turn inside the other so they can draw a gun beat on together. And that, that spiral, right, the, the tighter you can turn, if you can turn inside your adversary, you win. Observe, orient, decide, act, right? If you're in an adversarial system, both sides are running some version of that thought loop. You observe the world around you, situate yourself in it, you orient yourself within a scope of possible choices, you decide on one, you execute, you return to observing. If you can execute that loop faster at the same evaluation depth as your opponent, all else being equal, you win. Now, one of the things which is interesting about that loop is that it leaves absolutely no time for anything which is not on the critical path. There's a massive, massive cost to being in an adversarial situation. Um, Taylor Swift also has a, a computer security career. I'm happy to talk about that as well find me far after a drink. Um, one of the very interesting things, if you're looking at a, uh, if you're looking at a system that you model collaborative, right, and if you assume that there are no adversarial components in a system, there are things that you can do from within that model framework that you cannot do without it, right? You can get kind of um, fully optimized collaboration, right? There are, there are significant and unli not unlimited, but unlimited except from resource structure upsides that you can unlock if you can construct a situation which is actually collaborative. However, the flip side is you will not see any of the adversarial things, right? Someone who takes an adversarial approach to that situation can just blindside you and kind of wipe, wipe you off the map. So there's a really big trade-off. This has been a, a non-trivial personal lesson for me. Uh, in the past uh, few months, I think in adversarial systems, I always have thought in adversarial systems, it turns out that there are some assumptions you make about the world which are not great if you do that. Um, but you need both. Um, however, that thing where it's gonna be very lucky if we can make a plan B, we probably can't get to a plan B in an adversarial model, which has some interesting implications for the world. 
So let's talk a little bit about infrastructure and superstructure and structure. Those are our three orders of structure. Um, so all systems have three layers, right? The structure of a system, whether it's like, uh, I don't know, a, a political party or a court system or um, a LARP, right? The, the structure is the thing that you are trying to do within the scope of that domain, right? We want to run a LARP about, I don't know, ancillary justice, and it's going to be two and a half hours long and focus on serving tea. Talk to me later. Um, uh, so that's, that's the structure. Now we have an infrastructure, right? We have a set of things that we depend on for this. Okay, we're going to run it at a black box conference. We have a room. We have a globally organized civilization, an internet, a LARP scene. All of these things are infrastructure for that activity. Now we have superstructure. We have a governance layer, a social layer that sits on top of this, right? We have uh, an organizing team that has certain agreements with how they interact within that context. We have a set of players and how, you know, how we find players, how players decide what they want to do. This is all superstructure. So every problem, you have both of those two other simultaneous layers which you need to understand along with them. So our century is defined more than any other century by complex, possibly adversarial, socio-technical infrastructural systems. This is the world we live in. We can see and understand the systemic nature of the things that we rely on to continue existing. And we can modify that systemic structure often radically, often very quickly. This is new. This is not something that the human race has dealt with before. Unfortunately, we've also turned all of these systems into a battleground and we're very bad at managing them. If we can manage these, we live. However, we live in an era of unintended consequences. You build a global shipping network, you get people dying of cancer, breaking up the ships which are no longer economically viable. You get lots of weird, unintended things that were not what you thought you were trying to build. Transberg's first law, technology is neither good nor bad, nor is it mutual, right? A telephone is not a good thing, it's not a bad thing, but a telephone changes the world around you. Technical interventions change reality. They change the possibilities of reality, often in very fundamental ways. This is Stockholm in 19-something, probably starting with a one. Um, uh, this, was, this was how we ran telephone lines. Each one of those lines that you can't see in this very bad scan of a photo is a, is a pair of, of copper wires, and that was a phone line. And somewhere in there, there was a room full of people plugging cords in, and that was how the phone system worked. Um, we had no idea what this meant. We built this thing, and then it turned out to mean something. These people are trying to be in a different country. They are standing on a beach somewhere where they can get phone signal from Europe. And they are trying to cross a border without moving because that changes their life in certain kinds of ways. <coughs> this is a really interesting chart. Um, so remittances, people sending money home, um, have become large, they're, they're now larger than foreign aid. Right? All of the money that is spent globally on foreign aid, remittances are significantly larger. This curve is Skype. This curve is people being able to remain in touch with communities after they move overseas. It's also the ease of money transfers, which is also the internet. When we built the internet, we were not planning on undoing them on um, upsetting the balance of foreign aid. This wasn't something that anyone had even considered. Um, when we built the internet... I'm yep. sure question. I don't know what the word remittance means. Uh, remittance is basically uh, if someone is sending... Um, uh, I, move, uh, I move to New York, I get a job as a cab driver, I earn a reasonable wage locally, a, a not great wage locally, but an amazing wage from where I came from, so I send cash home. So, and, that's, and that's literally, it's, it's people's spare money from often low paying jobs at unimaginable scale. So when we built the internet, we also built structures which are incomprehensibly large compared to 
almost anything that we built beforehand, with the possible exception of the railroad, um, the amount of cable that was laid, these are all undersea cables. This is an old, old map, there's a lot more of them now. Um, we, we've literally tied the world with, with cables. Um, these guys, the nuclear bureaucracy, this is the NSA building in, um, in Northern Virginia, um, they didn't go anywhere. And the power relationship that the state and the population used to have was fundamentally changed by those cables. Zomia is dead, Zomia is gone. We don't have a way of getting outside of empire now because the ability of the state to enforce and make us legible has radically and fundamentally changed. And it's getting weirder. Um, so this is a slide from the Joint Threat Research Intervention Group, I think, JTRIG, I don't remember. Uh, Joint Threat Research Intelligence Group, which is a division of GCHQ that does um, cultural manipulation at population scale. That is what they do. They are, they are saying, okay, so great, everyone looks at the internet, we can change the internet. For who? Um, for the interests of uh, Her Majesty's government. Um, largely in counter-terror roles, but nip, what you got? Um, what we got is these guys. Um, so I don't know how many of these, how many of you are familiar with Keck and Pepe the Frog and all of the weird meme magic stuff that came out um, partially Russian sponsored, maybe, maybe not, we don't know, probably, um, in the US during the election. Um, this is literally a, a patch that's available on eBay for people who consider themselves veterans of, American veterans of a Russian influence operation where they tried to use chaos magic to throw an election with memes, and it worked. This is the world we live in now. When we built the internet, we were not planning that. <laughs> we were really not planning that. Uh, so we'd like to maybe know what we're building before we build it, or at least to have some bloody idea what it might mean. Um, Kelly Schilling, I don't like this word, but it's the best one I've found. She talks about the disposition of systems. So if you have a chessboard, right, chess as a game, has a disposition, it has sort of, you can think of it as like the probability structure that branches out from I'm sitting in a chessboard and you can move the pieces and you have different outcomes and there's sort of a space that spreads out. Like if you look at some of the visualizations of chess engines, there's a, there's a disposition for that game which is very different than like, the disposition of checkers is not dissimilar but much, much simpler, right? Um, so this is sort of a, 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 a probability structure, a potential structure in the world. A chess position, so a chess problem, like if you have, you know, you know, five or six pieces on each side, whatever, that has a disposition which is a subset of the disposition of chess. So this is a useful tool for thinking about all systems have dispositions. They're, if systems aren't static, the dispositions aren't static. But you can kind of think about holding this thing in your head. And of course, if they're social systems, they're very fuzzy dispositions. They're not, chess has a much more concrete disposition. Um, one of the things which is useful to think about is that we can evaluate this from an aesthetic frame. I'm gonna skip through these a little bit, but um, because, because complex systems are complex and they're often too big to think about um, rigorously and, and sort of fully evaluate, we can frame them from a perspective of like, you know, thinking like a painting, right? Like, does this feel right? Does this look like it's gonna feel like it should? Um, this isn't an image of the system. It's something that comes from experience. It's a fitness function. It's a way of evaluating a system that you can't understand. Um, this is a lot of what I do in the world. Um, ethics, by the way, you can run entirely within aesthetics. Is this, is this a pretty outcome from, a, from a, a, an aesthetic frame that, that you know, Things about ethics. Um, we used to do this with with planes. Um, there's this there's this um, idea that if it looks right, it flies right. This is literally how we designed airplanes before we understood aerodynamics. Um, and we still do this, right? There's a reason why these shapes are pretty, and a lot of that is the bias of aerospace engineers towards if it looks right, it flies right. It turns out it's not necessary. That thing looks really really ugly, and it falls out of the sky if the computer crashes, but it flies great. 
um, aesthetics of art. Yeah. Um, so one of the other things which is really, which combines interestingly with this, and this is where we start coming in, is that play is a way to experience systems. Because a lot of the knowledge that we need about what the internet might look like, what the internet might turn into, how we might reorganize production of whatever, we can't know. And we need a way to engage with knowledge that's tentative, that's uncertain, that allows for incorrectness and error, which is basically play. That's what we do when we play. We learn things that we don't understand. So this is a model of the ways that one can interact with systems, right? We talk about kind of the hard structure of systems. We can read and write the hard structure of systems if you want to like figure out what the structure of the system is or change it. But then we've also got this layer of affect, layer of the social. And we have pretty good tools if we want to um, read part of systems. We've got like a, a whole dis discipline of systems modeling, a bunch of which came out of the nuclear bureaucracy. Um, same thing for writing, if you want to change a hard system, or even sometimes a soft system, we've got a lot of tools there. We've got kind of politics, regulation, all of these different, you know, all of these different illicit and illicit tools for changing hard systems. Um, soft systems are a bit different, and it depends on what you're trying to do, like the, the, the more affective side. Um, there are things which I think are interesting when it comes to softest, when it comes to the affective side, things that we might want to immerse in. Um, there's a, a gentleman by the name of Utah Phillips, uh, who's an amazing folk singer and uh, storyteller, uh, died in 2008, I think. And my favorite quote of his, uh, he was an American, fought in the Korean War, did a bunch of stuff, but uh, the most radical thing that you can have in America today is a long memory. We forgot what the labor movement cost. We forgot what we did. Um, some of those lessons were not great, uh, but the scale of what it took to get labor rights, the scale of what it took to get a less abusive society, beggars the imagination. Um, the biggest strike in America, the biggest conflict in America, and there was more people died during the labor movement in the, in the years from like 1920 to 1938 or so than died in the Civil War. It was an amazing amount of social conflict um, because that was what it took in, in that time period. Uh, the Battle for Blair Mountain had 10,000 striking coal miners against the U.S. Army. They actually bombed the strike line from the air. You know, this population changes. This is the equivalent of a, of a strike in, in London, which has like 50,000 armed militants. You know, which is should not have happened then. That was a terrible action. It. it did not accomplish any of the goals it set out to, but just the scale, the scale of unrest, the scale of what we have done, the scale of that push is something which is worth remembering. Transnational solidarity, right? We, we think of ourselves, many of us think of ourselves as being from countries, as being within this system. It is useful to understand that our world is bigger and that we can all come together in, I don't know, say a hotel outside of Oslo, and learn about the struggles that other people are interacting with. Um, and likewise, understanding oppressions that are not ours, right? Understanding that like, okay, yes, I see your struggle, and I will put my body on the line to do things for other people because we all rise together or we don't. Um, embodying, I'm going to run through a couple of interesting projects. Um, so the, the scale where you can intervene in mixed social and technical systems is interesting and sometimes unexpected. Um, so there's a project that's been kind of poking along, and this is a slightly, parts of this deck are a bit old, so it hasn't gone in quite the ways that I would have liked, but um, in Dar es Salaam, uh, there's a lot of water points that have been built out with aid money. Um, many of them fail, uh, something like 70 something percent of them when, uh, when this project started were, were broken at any given time uh, because there wasn't really a maintenance infrastructure. Um, so some folks stood up a system called Tarifa, which was a, uh, a system where you could just like text in and SMS in a report of like, hey, something's busted, and then it would get coordinated, collated, sent up through the city, you know, funds would get dispatched from the same age funds, and then plumbers would get sent out. You know, this is the kind of governance system that 
exists in most major cities. Like, in, you know, this is not this is not anything radical. But if you don't have the infrastructure at all, somebody has to go build it. And it turns out that this kind of coordination structure is super cheap to build these days. Now, um, Tarifa is a centralized system um, that implies a certain structure of the state and of, and of governance on top of it. Um, there's a tool I've been working on, working with for a while called Briar, which looks at um, shifting that um, so that you can have applications that sort of exist on top of everyone's phone at the same time without ever actually living in a single specific place. And you can have a system like that do the exact same thing that a centralized governance system does and work in the same way. And then the governance system that you have is basically a, a configuration variable that you can change at runtime. So now maybe you can have a revolution and not have to rebuild all the infrastructure from scratch. And obviously, you know, don't try to have revolutions. They're generally terrible ideas. But, you know, there are possibilities for social change within the scope of infrastructure that, um, that are shifting, that are new. Um, let me skip past this one. Um, there's some interesting stuff that you can think about, ways of, ways of thinking about architecture differently. Um, this, is an, this is an interesting one. There are places where this stuff is happening in the real world, not necessarily places that we're comfortable with, um, but places you find strange outlets sometimes. Um, a few years ago, I spent an afternoon talking with the guy at DARPA whose job it was to do um, to design a course that every Marine, every U.S. Marine, got given uh, in basic training to make them better strangers. So you got an entire day of their time in a six-week training course, which is an amazing <laughs> amount of time in what is a just like designed down to the minute curriculum, basically, um, to teach these folks de-escalation, basically. So you have just blown the wall off of somebody's house with a breaching grenade, and you walk into their living room, and now you try not to shoot people. This is a thing that should exist in the world. It is, I and mean, we can talk about the role of something like that in a larger, the larger context of empire. It's not cut and dry, but you know there are there are places where work like this is happening to try to shift the outcomes of systems in ways which can have real impact. Now, in that case, I don't know, maybe it makes empire more efficient. You know, maybe it's actually not that good. We, you know, we don't know what the long tail of a lot of these things looks like. But, so I wanna talk about things that I think we can do with LARP that allow us to work in these spaces. Um, I think that there are basically, there are two, um, there are two modes that LARP can work in, um, diagnostic and constructive. So if you are looking, so you can run a LARP which tries to feel a system, that, tries, that sets up a little model of the system and tries to feel what it might mean in different ways. Um, there are things that LARP is very good at feeling. Okay, how does this intervention change the power balance in a given interaction? This is something which it's not necessarily easy to read from a description of the system, but when you live it, even in simulation, you, you feel it very easily. You know, this is a, this is a thing that we can use to read. Um, emotion, same thing. Um, is, this, is this a system that makes us feel happy? Is this a system that causes anxiety? I would, you know, separate from things around power. Viability. Just like, let's, you know, let's try this and give it a smell test. Is this thing remotely even plausible to happen in the real world, even if we're not running under real stakes, but we're running under as close as we can get? Um, we can also things within a framework of a LARP, and you know, within a fictive framework, and then try and move them into a real framework. Something will blow up, something will massively bite you if you do this. When the stakes become actually real, things change a lot. But that doesn't mean the tools can't work to some degree. And it doesn't mean that there aren't some tools that transfer over. These are possibilities that exist within the toolkit. You can create belief, right? You can structure knowledge and an understanding about the world that you collectively decide to agree on, whether or not it's true, right? Do the people, do the, do the catch soldiers believe, you know, do the, the Pepe the Frog people actually believe in mean magic? Who cares? It worked for them. Like, you know, reality is not necessarily the relevant function depending on what you're trying to do. 
Um, and even if it is real, like sharing, a, sharing, you know, there's a difference between knowing intellectually that a thing is true and really having it in your gut that it's true. And sometimes that difference is living it. We can build rituals. We're, we're very good at building rituals. We are in Norway. Um, uh, but I mean, really, we can build rituals of life, right? We can build rituals that actually have meaning to us. And we can view those rituals with pastness. Um, one, of the, one of the problems, and we, we kind of get by this in LARP through force of will and suspension of disbelief, but if you try to build a new social ritual, it's really awkward and it doesn't really mean the right thing. If you played that ritual a few times and it starts meaning the right thing in the game, you use your suspension of disbelief to get past that hurdle, then maybe you step out of the fictional frame and you know, the ritual still works. Pastness is still there. You can take these things with you. Um, so, I cannot remember the source of this quote, but um, a friend of mine is fond of saying, uh, live, as the, live as though you walk in the first days of a better nation. I would prefer to say, live as though you walk in the first days of a healing world. <laughs> <laughs>